His eyes widen as he reads the text on his comm. Mind readers. Great. That's a problem on more levels than he can consider. Honeymoon or not, he's on information gathering duty. Is something wrong? Miro Noir asks, and he gives a rueful smile. Just that everyone on the Dauntless have found something new to panic about, he says, and she flops down next to him on the couch and cuddle close. He puts his arm around her and luxuriates with her for a bit. Must I ask? She asks, and he chuckles. Mind readers are the scare of the day. After we found our ways around hackers, I suppose it was inevitable. A lot of people on that ship can't function without having some kind of crisis to panic about. He explains, and she just lets out a contented sigh as she snuggles into his side. They don't need to panic much. Axiom adepts are rare enough. Rarer still are the ones that have a more spiritual connection like you. Those that learn to touch minds are rare again. But I thought anyone could do those things. Yes, but so few do. It's not something you need to survive, so it's not something that's bothered with for most. Most people just want a happy, healthy life and don't want to push themselves the way they need to. She explains and he nods as his hand snakes onto her back and he begins to trace small circles in it, getting a little sigh of happiness. He considers the fact that she didn't deny that anyone could be a mind reader. And it's only how hard a skill set it is to learn that keeps everyone from being a mind reader. Not very comforting. Spies are rarely stupid schmucks who just walk in and do what they want. That dumb kid that Sir Philip scared off notwithstanding, let alone that a mind reading interrogator might discover all sorts of terrible things without even touching someone. Is it really so bad if someone might take a peek? Afraid of what they'll find? Miro Noir teases, and he freezes at the thought. It is that bad? She asks in shock, and he forcefully relaxes. Yes, no, it's hard to explain. You see, human psychology is a complicated thing, and there's just such a huge mess that it might get us declared insane, even if we're as stable as bedrock. Oh? She asks, sitting up a little more to better see his face. One of the more popular theories is of Sigmund Freud, who theorizes that there are three parts of the mind. They're called the id, the ego, and the superego, or more accurately, instinct, reason, and morals. If a mind reader just listens to my thoughts, they'd get a jumble of all three. If they take a picture of my thoughts, then they'd get all three as well. Do you think that such a thing is accurate? Freud's theory makes sense to me. Somewhat. There are many other theories, but I haven't had a chance to really study them, so I can't say how it stacks up against its competition. Vernon remarks before shaking his head. No. I've also heard about yin-yang theory, or light and darkness. But the most common bit about most theories of the mind I've heard have many voices in our heads, something I know to be accurate. That sounds confusing. It can be. So, if you have three voices, what do they say? Right now? Un, hm. She confirms as she cuddles back into him. Well, right now they're actually in agreement. Instinct says, cuddle with mate. Crude is the animal part of the mind as it knows what it likes. Morals say, cuddle with beloved because it's something you want that I'm happy to give. Reason says, cuddle with wife as I've got a good thing going and it would be wise to keep it that way. He says, and she smiles as he scooches to get more comfortable and quickly taps out what little he just learned in an English text for the Dauntless. That done, he puts it aside and pulls Miro Noir closer. They fall asleep and doze away the day, waking up well after dinner with a burning hunger that sets them both to quickly making a meal. Hoagies might not be romantic, but they are deeply satisfying for both. Though Miro Noir stays well away from Vernon's meal with the mustard he put on it, she can digest the stuff, but just knowing that mustard gas exists keeps her well off it. His quick bit of research and finding out that mustard gas is called that because impure forms smell like mustard has not helped his case. If it smells like a massively dangerous poison, then I'm not going to risk it, she remarks primly. No, it doesn't. A massively dangerous poison smells like mustard. Complete opposite, he says, and she snorts in amusement. Yes, because that's the part that I'm concerned about. Oh my goodness, how do humans even find a poison? 
We generally bet a less intelligent friend that there's no way they could eat that or find that a friend has snuck something into our meal for a joke, he says, and she struggles to keep her mouth closed as she laughs. I'll get you some water, he says, standing up and heading into the kitchen. And none of your tricks, she teases after him. Oh, not even this, he asks, walking back in, carrying a pair of glasses as a globe of water floats behind him. He places one in front of her and the second in front of his own plate, as the globe divides in half and mostly fills both glasses. You know what I meant, and don't you deny it. She chides him and he chuckles. Well, yes, but isn't the whole point of a boundary to be pushed? No, not it's not, she says with a smile. Then how can you find out where the real limits are? How can you learn where you grow? By following the paths of those who have achieved what you seek. But they haven't done everything. Someday someone will look back upon these times and use them to see where they can go. In that light, is it not our duty to see where we can go? Oh, stop. Excelling while nice isn't needed. Not sure that's an entirely honest bit of advice, oh, princess, he remarks, and she smiles, but merely takes a bite of her sandwich rather than answer. You know, the next Shellcracker tournament is coming up soon. It's not on Centris, however. I'd love to he says, and she beams. The chance to participate in something in that sounds like a wonderful experience. Pardon? she asks. That went a direction she wasn't expecting. If she could read minds, she'd see the panic running through his mind at that slip-up. Well, you're a princess, and it would be more appropriate if you were married to a prince after all. Is that not how it works? he asks, hoping it's the right answer. He hates it when his mouth runs off on him. Sure, it's very honest, but not everyone likes that. In fact, few people do. Oh, you... She's at a loss for words, but there's an enormous dopey smile on her face. You don't have to prove yourself to me. You're not in cruel space. And if I want to? If I want the galaxy to know that you chose so well that I can stand by your side rather than at your back in battle... He asks walking around the table and hugging her from behind. She rises up to kiss him, her insides too warm and mushy to say anything coherent. She luxuriates with a full stomach and a loving husband before finding some words as he holds her. You know, it has happened before. Other races have tried the shellcracker tournaments. They rarely do well. Not much instinct to protect the shell or they poorly forge one. Winning isn't likely, possibly even impossible, but I want to at least try he says, and she can imagine it, her instructing her eager student in the forging of his shell, him going out all excited and coming back dejected into the comfort of her arms, some sweet assurances whispered into his ear, leading into a night where he bears his frustrations in a rough round of love and, are you all right? He asks gently and breaks her out of her fantasy. Oh, yes, I am. I, maybe, yes, yes, I will help you. The rules of the tournament say you must forge the shell yourself but having instruction from another is allowed. Not to mention differing shapes and materials are allowed. The only rule is they must be worn into the arena and protected. Some of the more rambunctious girls paint lurid images or insulting phrases. It rarely works, however. I'd imagine not. Does it have to all one piece or only protect the back? No, technically you could walk in with a cardboard box with holes for the arm and head. You won't win, but it would be a slap in the face to every opponent you face. There's always some crazy girl that tries that, a challenge to everyone by making their shell out of something frail. All it has to be is worn over your clothing and something you can take off and remain decent. He pulls out his communicator as she finishes her explanation and brings up an image of a metal cuirass, a breastplate made of shining steel. If this was made out of tritite, would it be legal, he asks, and she gawks at the idea. Most shells focus heavily on the back, but if he's going all the way around, yes, but it would be heavy, not to mention it would limit your own abilities. The tournament is one of axiom power. You wouldn't be able to, oh yes, you don't breathe fire. However, tritite is hard to mold and manipulate. Something like this, then, he asks, bringing up the image of a chainmail vest. Just a bit cruder. The coins can be bound together by another metal, and that way, if worse comes to worse, I can break my own shell to surrender, but still have the protection of tritite against more unusual axiom tricks. He explains, 
and her mind turns a little. It wouldn't be as protective, but it would be light and strong, especially against Axiom techniques. The metal is downright immune to Axiom and short of Null, which eats its way through the lifeblood of the universe. It was the best way to keep you safe from it, and the tournament is one of Axiom use. Many take the time to show off exotic techniques with it. By wearing Treetite, you'd render yourself nearly impervious to most of them. And since you can make it out of coins, all you have to do is forge the connectors and then tie it all together in the right pattern. Even better is if I make a machine to forge those connectors, then an armor like this will have practical use. Axiom, proof vests. Something the Dauntless needs. Do you sense war on the horizon? I'm not certain, but plan for the worst while hoping for the best. It's very hard to hinder yourself due to being overly prepared, he says, and she smiles. Take that attitude into the tournament and I'll have no issue cheering from the crowd. I'll look for you in it with a fervor, he vows, and she sighs. Her life is a saccharine romance and she loves it. If her family could watch her, they'd think they were putting on a show. But he means it. He actually means it. Gooey, sticky, warm, bubbly, sappy love was all hers. She didn't even want to look for a sister bride, just hold on to him as tightly as she could and soak it all in for as long as possible. But they'd luxuriated most of the day away already. She and he needed to get something other than falling deeper in love done or they'd never accomplish anything ever again. Then let's get started on designing those connectors, shall we?